Hey there folks, I'm Joshua Oral, the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oral Reports. Hey Josh! Hey Steven, what brings you here on my show? Wait, you're doing your show right now? Yeah. Ah, uh, great. I got all this, this I ate lunch earlier, and I got all this junk on my show. I mean, look at me, I look like a schmuck. <laughs> Don't worry, it's okay. Anyway, with the 4th of July coming up in a couple days, I decided to blog a film that has its own both action-packed and patriotic. Yeah. Our subject of today is a film that was released around the mid-90s that had its own patriotic feel to it, and the man responsible for it was none other than Roland Emmerich. Hey, Jordan. That's right. Released on July 2nd, 1996, the movie is Independence Day. So let's get started. On July 2nd, communication systems worldwide are sent into chaos by a strange atmospheric interference. It is soon learned by the military that a number of enormous objects are on a collision course with Earth. Guess what those are, guys! <laughs> At first thought to be meteors, they are later revealed to be gigantic spacecraft piloted by a mysterious alien species. After an attempt to communicate with the aliens go nowhere, David Levinson, an ex-scientist turned cable technician, discovers that the aliens are going to attack major points around the globe in less than a day. On July 3rd, the aliens all but obliterate New York City, Los Angeles, which is where I was born, and Washington, D.C., as well as Paris, London, Houston, and Moscow. Well, they didn't destroy Houston. We destroyed Houston. But anyway. Yeah. The survivors set out in convoys towards Area 51, a strange government testing grounds where it is rumored that the military have us captured alien spacecraft of their own. The survivors devise a plan to fight back against the enslaved being aliens, and on July 4th becomes the day humanity will fight for its freedom. July 4th, being their Independence Day. So, what did I think of this film? Well, it's a bit cheesy and intense at times, but mostly, it was awesome! Yeah, it is. Um, there are a couple of funny things in the movie. For some reason, it tries to out-gay Top Gun. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, there, there are times when it doesn't. Like, when they do the military stuff, yeah. <laughs> but, other than that, it's a, it's a fun flick. And yeah, there are some plot holes here and there. We all know the plot holes, because we've watched other YouTube videos about Independence Day. Like, well, oh, this was supposed to sort of bust the movie by itself. But, um, anyway, um, yeah. It's fun flick. So, about to explain why we love it, let's move on to Mustang Notes. The idea for the film came when Emmerich and Dean Devlin were in Europe promoting their film, Stargate. A reporter asked Emmerich why he made a film with content like Stargate if he did not believe in aliens. Emmerich stated that he was still fascinated by the idea of an alien arrival and further explained his response by asking the reporter to imagine what it'd be like to wake up one morning and discover a 15-mile-wide spacecraft that was hovering over the world's largest cities. Emmerich then turned to Devlin and said, I think we have an idea for our next film. Emmerich and Devlin decided to expand on the idea, incorporating a large-scale attack. With Devlin saying that he was bothered by the fact, for the most part, in alien invasion films, they come down to Earth and they're hidden in some backfield. Emmerich agreed by asking Devlin, If arriving from across the galaxy, would you hide on a farm, or would you make a big entrance? The two wrote the script, but uh, during a, a month-long vacation in Mexico, Pre-production began just three days later in February 1995. The U.S. military were intended to provide personal vehicles and costumes for the film. However, they backed out when the producers refused to remove the script's Area 51 references. Now, now here's the thing with that for me. 
Um, they comment about if you were an alien, would you be like, would you make a big entrance or not? How are they going to know where our major cities are? This is like, um, yeah, they decided to go to Washington, New York, LA for kicks and giggles, I guess? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, a big record 3,000 plus special effects shots would ultimately be required in the movie. The shoot ultimately um, utilized on set in camera special effects more often than computer generated effects in an effort to save money and get more authentic cryogenetic results. Many of these shots were... Uh, anyway. Anyway, many, many of them... Many of these shots were accomplished at a huge aircraft in Culver City, California. Where the film's art department, motion control, photo photography teams, pyrotechnic, pyrotechnic. pyrotechnic team, and model shops were headquartered. The production's model making department built more than twice as many miniatures for the production that had been ever been built for any film before by creating miniatures for buildings, city streets, aircraft, landmarks, and monuments. The crew also built miniatures for several of the spaceships featured in the film, including a 30-foot destroyer model and a version of the mothership spanning 12 feet. City streets were recreated and then tilted upright beneath a high-speed camera mounted on a scaffolding filming downwards. An explosion would be ignited below the model and flames would rise toward the camera, engulfing the tilted model and creating the rolling wall of destruction to look and see in the film. A model of the White House was also created covering 10 feet by 5 feet and used in forced perspective, perspective shots, before being destroyed in a similar fashion for its own destruction scene. The, the detonation took a week to plan and required 40 explosive charges. Wow. A World War II training aircraft with a camera mounted on the front navigated through the walls of Little Colorado, Can Colorado River Canyon, <clears throat> and the footage was used as a pilot point of view shots. Principal photography began in July 19th, 1995 in New York City. A second unit gathered pl plate shots and established shots from Manhattan, Washington, D.C., an RV community in Flagstaff, Arizona and a very large array on the plains of St. Augustine, New Mexico. The main crew also filmed the nearby Cliffside Park, New Jersey, before moving to the former Kaiser Steel Mill in Fontana, California, to film the post-attack Los Angeles sequences. The production then moved to Wendover, Utah, and West Wendover, Nevada, where the desert settled for Imperial Valley, and the, Wendo and the Wendover Airport doubled for El Toro and Area 51 exteriors. Fun fact, we actually live, like, a few miles from El Toro, the actual place. It's, it's interesting. It's actually, fun fact, um, El Toro Airways has, at least used to, have the longest runway in the world. Nice. Fun fact. All right. Um, it was here where Pullman filled his pre-battle speech. Immediately before filming the scene... Edmund Pullman decided to add, Today we celebrate our Independence Day, to the end of the speech. At the time, the production was nicknamed ID4, because Warner Brothers owned the rights to the title Independence Day. And that when he hoped, if Fox executive noticed the addition in that, in Bailey's, the impact of the new dialogue would help them win the rights to the title. The right to use the title was eventually won two weeks later. The production team moved to the Bonnefeld Salt Flats to film three scenes and then returned to California to film in various places around Los Angeles, including a huge aircraft, 
which stands for the Cable Company and Area 51 Interiors, were constructed at a former, former aircraft plant. Said the layer included corridors and containing windows that were covered by blue material. The filmmakers originally intended to use the chroma key technique to make it appear as if activity was happening on the other side of the glass. But the compo composited images were not added to the final part because production designers decided to, that the blue panels gave the set a clinical look. The attacker hangar set contained an attacker mock-up 65 feet, which is 65 feet wide, that is, that took four months to build. The White House interior sets used had already been built for the American president and had previously been used for Nixon. Now it's time to move on to the cast of this film. Um, Captain Stephen Hiller is played by Will Smith, an assured Marine Corps, U.S. Marine Corps F-18 pilot with VLA 314 uh, Black, Black Knights. We don't have that written on the script, so I'm um, sorry. Uh, Devlin and Emmerich have always envisioned an African American for this role, and specifically wanted Smith after seeing his performance in Six Degrees of Separation. So, like, this guy really has a neat hero, like, like, during the fight scene, like, after the destruction of L.A., it's really neat, like, seems like he's the only one who's able to use his ejection seats, like, when his plane... Yeah, that, that, that's the one thing that I found absolutely hilarious, like, the, the one pilot who's like, I can't pull my stick up, I can't, I don't know, I can't pull up, no, like, at what point do you go, okay, I'm six in, I'm out. Whitmore, played by Lone Star himself, Bill Pullman. He's a former Persian Gulf War pilot, and he is to prepare, for, in order to prepare for the role, Pullman read Bob Woodward's The Commander and watched the documentary film The War Room. Mm, Don't fight in the War Room! <laughs> Name the reference, Jeff. Nice. Do you know the reference? No. Back to Strange Love. Jeff Must Go Fast for Goldblum plays David Levinson, an MIT-educated computer expert, chess enthusiast, and environmentalist, working as a satellite technician in New York City. Like in this film, he's the one who stumbled onto the alien signal and was able to warn the president about what was going on. And like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, next up is David's dad, Julius Levinson, who was played by Jude Hirsch. I mean, this character, it was based on one of the producers, Dave Levin's uncle. It's some way, for some reason. Like, uh, Julius, um, while he has been a, a major help for, for David, like, able to help David find Constance's phone number in his laptop phone book or help him find a um, solution to, to stop the alien's force fields. Like, yeah. That's a good job in the role. Yeah. Next we have President Whitmore's wife, the First Lady Marilyn Whitmore, who is played by Mary McDonald. I mean, she not, may not have much of a big role in this film, but it is tragic seeing her barely in injured severely after the Los Angeles explosion, like... I think you just gave away some spoilers, dude. Sorry. And next up is President Whitmore's daughter, Patricia Whit Whitmore, who is played by none other than May Whitman. And yes, the very same May women who would become Katara in Avatar The Last Airbender and Tinkerbell in the CGI spin-offs. Doesn't that sound kind of cool how it's like, yeah, I really, really like the character of Katara. I love Avatar The Last Airbender. I don't think that either uh, M. Night Shyamalan's movie or uh, James Cameron's movies do 
any good. And I say James Cameron because I really hated the movie Avatar. But yeah. I think you're off topic here. Well, yeah, but we get a little bit of random playing time, don't we? Yeah. So what do you think of May Women's role as a little girl here? She does a good enough job. I mean, she's a child actor. She does good. Next, we have White House Communications Director and David's ex-wife, Constance Spano, played by Margaret Collin. What do you think about this character, Josh? Well, uh, I mean, she is kind of a... She's mostly loyal to the president, but when David tries to warn her at first, she's kind of stubborn around him at times. Like, yeah, I mean, it's ex-wife kind of thing, man. It's like, oh, they're still in love. She's got enough for her career. And it's like, oh, well, you go. Yeah, but that part at the, when when they reach the White House and like and using that satellite thing on was kind of cracks me up every time. It was weird. I, I, the character's a little weird. Yeah, I think. Next up, we have the U.S. Secretary of Defense and the former director of the CIA, Albert. Z Nimzicki. Nimzicki, played by the late James Redhorn. Redhorn described the character as being much like Oliver North. The character's eventual firing lampoons... Joe Nimzicki. Joe Nimzicki, the MGM's head of advertising, who reportedly accounted for unpleasant experiences for Devlin and Emmerich when studio executive forced for cuts of Stargate. And to be honest, like, everything about Nimziki's attitude describes how he is. Like, he really is a weasel, as Whitmore says he is. Yeah. It's like, even... Dude's a jerk. Even, like, saying, like, nukes are an option, or, like, the stuff about the alien po uh, aircraft being, like... Yeah, um... Oh. What the president says, um, you, you knew about Area 51. Why didn't you mention this when the alien showed up? Yeah, good point. Yeah, and the president got it, so it's not like it's a major plot hole, but, yeah. Next on the list is General William Gray, played by Robert Logia, whom I never heard of before, and I don't know anything memorable he's been in. But anyway, he's a U.S. Marine Corps general who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Logia modeled the character after generals of World War II, particularly George S. Patton. Fun fact about George S. Patton, um, uh, the voice that is... That is that uh, George C. Scott portrays him in the really rough voice that everyone portrays him as. He didn't really have that voice. I've heard a recording of the man whose voice is actually quite high pitched. Yeah. Fun fact. But anyway, William Gray is a really support great supporting character. He does story. a good job. He does a good job. I didn't necessarily see George S. Patton in the performance, but he did a good job. Okay, we've already moved on to David's relatives and the, the, the president's staff, so let's move on to Steve's family. Jacqueline Dunbrow is played by Viv Vivica A. Fox, who you may know from Ellen Chang as this lovely fairy here. Anyway. In this film, Jasmine is a single mother and Steven's girlfriend, who becomes his wife at the end of the film, and she's also an um, exotic dancer. Not much to say about the character, really. Just kind of there. But she does support some, uh, how to say, Los Angeles survivors. Yeah, she does. She, she's... She seems to be rather genre savvy when it comes to this movie. And next up is another child character in this film, who is actually Jasmine Dunbrough's son, Dylan, played by Ross Bagley. Not much to say about him. Again, another child actor. It's not like there's a whole lot to say about him. Yeah. 
And next up is another child character in this film, who is actually Jasmine Dunbrock's son, Dylan, played by Ross Bagley. Not much to say about him. Again, another child actor. It's not like there's a whole lot to say about him. Russell Case is played by Randy Quaid, who plays a really silly Disney villain, a really silly Disney movie. Russell is a widowed alcoholic crop duster and veteran Vietnam War pilot who claims to have been an alien abductee ten years prior to the film's events. The film originally depicted Russell Cassie be, being rejected as a volunteer for the July 4th area counteroffensive because of his alcoholism. He then used a stolen missile tied to his red biplane to carry out his suicide mission. Yeah, again, spoilers, guys. Sorry about that. According to Dean Devlin, test audiences responded well with the scene's irony and comedic value. However, the scene was reshot to include Russell's acceptance as a volunteer. His crash course in modern fighter aircraft, which is a pretty entertaining scene, and him flying an F A 18 instead of his biplane. Devlin prefers the alteration because the viewer now witnesses Russell ultimately making the decision to sacrifice his life, and seeing the biplane keeping pace and flying amongst F A 18s was just not believable. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. However, I find, like, even though Russell is a bit of a drunkard, he is a very hilarious character. Yeah, and he, he has a lot of the good, a lot of really good lines in the movie when they actually give his character some decent dialogue. He gets probably the most memorable, one of the most memorable lines in the movie, and that's for sure. Yeah. Next, Russell's kids, Miguel, Alicia, and Troy, are played by James Duvall, Lisa Jacob, and Giuseppe Andrews. I mean, like, I mean, each of them has a certain bit of, like, theme to who they are. I mean, like, Miguel is a more responsible person, Alicia is someone who wants to have a boyfriend, and Troy, is, since he's the youngest, he gets sick most of the time. Like, yeah, he, he's the token sick kid that, like, that a lot of movies have, like, Oh, I'm the throw a sick kid! Cut, cut, cut! <laughs> that really serves no purpose to the plot, except for, token sick kid, look how sad this person is. Yeah. Now for a couple of uh, characters for you really big sci-fi fans out there like me. First off, you got the hero of Canton himself, Alan Baldwin as Major Mitchell, a U.S. Air Force officer who is Area 51's commanding officer. Now, I'm sure a few of you at least know of his awesome role in the unfortunately way too short TV show, Firefly. Um, his voice in this is not nearly as gruff. Um... He's a lot, he's probably a bit young, he's definitely a bit younger, and this is, yeah. I guess this is when Fox was cool back then. Sure. Anyway, Major, what are your thoughts? Well, Mitchell does mean, like, once the, the group get to Area 51, he does, like, do a good job, like, giving the people a tour of the place, and also, like, all his gunslinging abilities are really cool. Like, yeah, I'm sure. Most, and uh, honestly, that's probably what the actor is best known for is his gunslinging. Espe especially if you watch Firefly, he does a lot of gunslinging. Sure. Steven, is there any other memorable people from Area 51 that's worth mentioning here? Actually, there's a probably an even bigger. Uh, Actually, more of a cameo, I guess, here with uh, Brackish Oaken, who is played by Brent Spiner, who a lot of you probably know as Data from Star Trek The Next Generation. He's nothing like Data in this movie, but it's just kind of cool to see that Data's in this movie. Um... 
Um, he's kind of the eccentric guy. He's like, ooh, this is this whole alien invasion thing is exciting and cool things happening. Bill Pullman's like, dude, people are dying. And yeah, he's a very eccentric character, very fun character. But again, he's nothing like Data. Yeah. Fun fact, though. Devlin, who opened the idea of bringing Dr. Oaken back in the event of a sequel, later implied the character is merely in a coma when he appears to have been killed by the aliens. Um, spoilers again. However, the character's appearance and verbal style are based upon Bell's visual effects supervisor, Jeffrey A. Oaken, with whom Emirates had worked on Stargate with. Huh. Interesting. But anyway, like, like you said, Ogin is a really eccentric character. Yeah. Now the last character we need to talk about are the villains of this film. The aliens, whose vocal effects are done by the legendary Frank Welker. Now the film's aliens were designed by production designer Patrick Tatopoulos. The actual aliens of the film are diminutive and based on the design by design Tatopoulos drew when tasked by Emirates to create an alien that was both familiar and completely original. Those, these creatures were, they wear biomechanical suits that are based on another design Tatopoulos pitched Emirates. These suits were like 8 feet tall, equipped with 25 tentacles and purposely designed to show it that it could not sustain a person inside, so it would not appear to be a man in a suit. So, like, what are your thoughts on this information about the, the, the invaders? I think it's interesting. I, um, I wonder how they actually uh, pulled it off, actually. Yeah, like, I can't really think it's CG, because it, it looks... It, it's not CG. It's probably puppet, puppetry. Maybe. Probably. Or a mix between puppet or costume, I think. Like, I'm not really totally sure. Because there only was a time before Google, so... Yeah. And now to move on to our final words in this movie. Overall, Independence Day is a real action-packed sci-fi film. It's a great film to watch during the 4th of July event. The characters are memorable, the air battles are badass, and, but the destruction scenes are really intense. So, Stephen, what do you have to say about it? This is kind of the movie that The Phantom Menace was trying to be. If you understand what I'm saying, if you look at The Phantom Menace, the last, like, third of the movie, after all the boring stuff and the Jar Jar, and they saw Jar Jar in the third act, but it wasn't, it's just... They, like, with the, the Nebu Starfighters going up against the, uh, against the, uh, Trade Federation blockade, it was basically one of the, it was basically like the battle at the end of this movie, um, in the point of somebody flying into the ship. Now, granted, the person didn't die, um, probably would have been a case of Problem Solved series over when it comes to Star Wars, but... Um, again, um, overall, I enjoy, I enjoy the movie. It's a, it's a good flick. Um, I'm not, I don't quite agree with you on the patriotic feel of it. Because like they said, they kind of threw in the Independence Day line last minute. Yeah, I can understand that. And there's not a whole lot in the movie that down that streams, oh, no! Oh, America, oh, freedom, except for the fact that the Americans are the only people that are trying to do anything about it, and everyone's just kind of sitting around going, I wonder when the Americans are going to do something about this. Yeah, but it's not just patriotic feel that equals Independence Day. It also equals, you know, like, everyone, whether being, you know, like, uh, heroes, soldiers, patriots, everyone who's risking their lives for their freedom. Yeah, I guess you could say that. So, for my rating, I give this film 100%. Well, uh, Steven, what's your rating? Probably around 80-ish, I'm going to say. 80-ish percent. 
Um, I don't usually give, uh, I don't like giving ratings, so I'm just kind of spitballing here. It was a matter, it was a good, fun flick. I enjoy it. Well, that's it for today, everybody. I want to thank Steven Smead for joining me today to blog this epic film. You're welcome, pal. So, I hope we can do another blog sometime. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we still got the Miyazaki one we still have yet to do. Yeah, that's true. That's going to take a lot of... A bit of it's going to take a bit of action for the two of us. I've only seen... I've honestly only seen like three. Yeah. So, as for the rest of you viewers out there, be sure to join me next time for my next blog on Mustang Prince Oral Reports. Mustang Power. And, uh, have a great time of July, everybody.